Um, as I said, I'm Richard Sakharides. Um, I have, uh, I'm head of a new initiative in Washington called Equality Matters, which is a new media and communications initiative focused on LGBT rights in our nation's capital. Um, I was fortunate enough to serve uh, in the uh, Clinton administration as a White House advisor to President Clinton on LGBT rights during the um, during his second term as president. And I'm very pleased and honored to be here uh, and join you uh, on this panel on LGBT rights. I actually think it's the first panel that CGIU has had on LGBT rights, and we're excited to do it. Um, so I'm, we, we're, we're, we're incredibly lucky uh, this morning to have with us three amazing activists um, we're going to talk to us a little bit about the state of LGBT rights, LGBTQ rights, I should probably say, right? Uh, both here in the U.S. and internationally, so I'm going to introduce them in order. Um, our first panelist is Alexis Ortega, who is the founding member of a grassroots student-led initiative called the National Marriage Boycott, which she started when she was a student at Stanford in 2008. Uh, in late 2008, after the uh, passage here in California of Proposition 8, which was the uh, California proposition that outlawed uh, same-sex marriage. So please help me welcome Alexis. Um, our next panelist is um, Jenny Pizer. Now, Jenny is the the legal director and senior scholar at the Williams Institute at UCLA School of Law, which is a national think tank focused on sexual orientation and legal matters. How does it sound, how does it sound to say that? It's a little strange, right? This is Jenny's first day on that job. Because, <laughs> uh, that's why I asked her, how does it sound to hear that? She said, like this. Um, it's, because, uh, it's because for 15 years uh, prior to this morning, uh, she was the um, senior counsel and director of the marriage project for Lambda Legal, which is the nation's oldest, uh, largest, and, uh, and most successful uh, organization uh, focused on gay rights here in the U.S. Uh, and high-impact litigation. They do litigation, I'm sure you've heard of them, all over the country, and have done some of the cutting-edge stuff. She's going to talk to us about it, uh, but they're involved in the Lawrence v. Lawrence v. Texas case and the Romer v. Evans case, so all the important cases up till now and the ones that are working their way through the court, Jenny has already worked on. Please welcome Jenny Pizer. Okay, last but not least, I am very pleased to have met uh, this morning and also to have us join us, uh, Steve Namande, who is the chairperson of an organization uh, called Alternatives Cameroon, which is a organization focused on human rights and HIV issues, uh, which he helped found in Cameroon in 2006 um, he is really one of the great leaders in Africa uh, for LGBTQ rights and around HIV issues. And he is an award-winning human rights activist globally, also a medical doctor. Please help me welcome Steve. Okay, and you had a long flight, right? You had a long trip here. <laughs> okay, but we're glad to have you, and you're here right on time. All right, so uh, I'm going to turn my back to some of you a little bit so I can look at our panelists for a minute. And um, all right, so I want to start with um, Jenny and ask you to give us a little bit of a snapshot of the uh, political and especially legal issues facing the LGBTQ community here domestically in the United States? Well, I'm happy to. Um, and I think actually we're moving to LGBTIQ. Never okay, let even things I'm rest learn for a minute. We're <laughs> constantly evolving and growing. So um, 
In terms of, and it is, I, I'm, I want to start by saying actually, it's really a thrill to see you guys all here and to have uh, these issues in the blend of all of these incredibly important issues that uh, you all are focusing on at this convening. Uh, and, I, you know, in a, in a way, it, it does feel fitting what I want to say as a starting framing of a snapshot um, is that we are at a, a moment in the U.S. of a lot of breakthroughs. I mean, there are a number of different things that seem like firsts. Um, some of them are, are firsts that we've been working toward for a very long time, but, but we're at a time of intense change, and so it is a particularly auspicious moment um, to have some greater focus on what's happening, why it's happening, and how we can make it all accelerate by greater engagement, um, the work that each one of us can be doing um, in our lives. So, you know, what's happening right now? Well, just within the last couple of months, very recently, uh, we've seen at, at, the, at the close of last year, we saw um, the, uh, the U.S. Senate pass the bill to finally repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and the President was waiting to receive it uh, and to, to take the next step, a really significant step forward to ending that policy. Um, which, you know, probably stating the obvious, but it has been a huge priority um, because this was about our own government saying that, um, that not that not that lesbian and gay people or LGBT people um, are not fit to serve. What the policy said was that the military would be so destabilized if straight people knew that their comrades were gay that it would impair military effectiveness. And um, people really believed that some time ago, but over the years, it's been shown that that really isn't true. People actually can do their jobs quite fine, gay and straight alike. It happens in civilian society, and it, it's true in the military as well. But that policy represented the government overtly discriminating. And so it's been incredibly important to get rid of it. And, and this was a, it's not gone yet, but the, the getting that law passed was huge. Um, and shortly on the heels of that, um, just uh, in February, the Justice Department uh, announced in litigation about the so-called Defense of Marriage Act, the federal statute that says that married gay people in this country are going to be treated as unmarried for purposes of federal law. Sort of like, la la la, we can't see your marriage, you're not really married, um, even though thousands of us are. Um, and This was even if your marriage was recognized in a state. Like if you were in a state like California for that brief period or in Iowa, the federal government was not going to recognize your marriage federally, even if you were legally married to your same-sex spouse in the state where you lived. That's right. The, the institute that I'm now just joining as of today, uh, the Williams Institute, um, does demographic research and have, has released the figures that it's be probably between 50 and 80,000 same-sex couples married in the U.S., legally married under state law, um, but the federal government is pretending they're not married. So that huge sort of statement of discrimination by the federal government, and, and uh, it's, it's been in court, we've been litigating, many of us have been litigating, uh, but the, the Justice Department has announced uh, that it's done its homework and concluded that it can't be defended. It's unconstitutional and, that, and the government will no longer defend it. That's a huge deal, right? Huge deal, and not just for marriage, certainly for marriage and family law generally, but it has ramifications for any time government or government officials are um, mistreating gay people, whether it's ba based on a law or based on police prosecution or based on schools not protecting queer youth, because part of the analysis was that anti-gay discrimination should be recognized as the kind of discrimination that requires courts to take a closer look, that it should be presumed probably unconstitutional unless the government meets a very, very high standard of proof. Now, this is, this is not going to, I want to interrupt you to keep it like, uh, to, to, to keep you on your toes, which I know you can do, but um, this was not, um, this is not going to now happen automatically, right? This issue has to work its way through the courts, correct? It, it has to work its way through the courts or through Congress. I mean, the Defense of Marriage Act is on the books, and the administration has said, we've concluded it's unconstitutional, but we're government lawyers. The president, as folks know, is a, constitution, is a constitutional lawyer himself. They've done the analysis. But the job of the executive branch is to enforce laws, 
to defend them most of the time, to enforce them generally speaking. It's up to the courts to decide for sure if something is unconstitutional or to Congress to repeal it. So there's an intense amount of work ahead now because while it, it is a powerful statement by the administration that this law in their view is unconstitutional and we certainly agree, we had been suggesting that they might come to that conclusion. We, th we think that that's true, but they're going to keep enforcing it um, while the cases make their way through the courts and while people debate it in Congress. And, and we'll be talking more about this, this kind of thing, but let me just flag, there's a lot of conversations that need to happen, not just in the halls of Congress and not just in government buildings, but in communities and around dinner tables, because okay, this is about this is about a process of social change. All right, that's a perfect segue to what I want to ask Alexis about. And that is, and we're going to get back to that with you, but um, so 2008, you were at Stanford, correct? Yes. And uh, Jenny was litigating in the uh, California courts and in the federal courts and arguing for um, our rights uh, with meeting with some, quite a bit of success in some cases, not so much success in others. Um, we, we got the right to marry in California, then it was taken away in November of 2008 by Proposition 8. And that is what, as, as I understand it, was the beginning of what, what, or part of a continuum, but maybe the last straw and what motivated you to start your initiative. Absolutely. Um, at Stanford, and sorry about my voice, I'm a little bit under the weather, so it's deeper than it normally is. Um, at Stanford, we were lucky to have a lot of queer activists who were very involved in the Prop 8 um, organizing. We hosted huge phone banks, um, some of the largest phone banks that happened on the West Coast. We did demonstrations. Um, the night of the election, we were outside, I think the, what's the regulation, like 100 feet or whatever from the um, right, polling however, places. However far you needed to be. Right, exactly. <laughs> we were outside that night holding signs um, and we had all heard the, uh, the polls leading up until the election and how it looked like we weren't going to win. I'm a, a really big optimist, so I still had hope until the very last second and we were all in the the LGBT Community Center um, when it was announced that Prop 8 uh, passed. And um, luckily, the community that, that I was surrounded by was very pissed off. We were angry. We were angry Stanford students um, who were in California thinking that this should not be happening. Why is this happening? Um, and we had discussions about what we could do to organize to demonstrate our anger. Um, I think that's where it came from, anger. Uh, talking about maybe having ceremonies where we get people who are married to rip up their marriage certificates in in a in a symbol in a a way to symbolize their anger and and also um, their uh, commitment to LGBT rights even if it doesn't necessarily affect them straight straight heterosexual couples. Um, so what we came to is that we wanted to show. The, the country basically and, and hopefully the world that queer youth, LGBT youth have a voice and we have a power and um, we felt like Prop 8 didn't really demonstrate that as effectively as it could have. So what we did is we started National Marriage Boycott um, and boycotting is something that we just felt How do like you come up with the name? It's a great name. <laughs> That's, why, that's one of the reasons why we came up with it. We wanted to come up with something that was very in your face. We weren't going to sit around and just let people push us around. Um, and National Marriage Boycott, we wanted to make it national, which is why we chose the word national. When we say marriage boycott, you know, if you're fighting for LGBT rights and you say marriage boycott, that's a little bit of a, there's a disjoint there because people are like, well, don't you want marriage equality? Um, and that's the whole point. We wanted to start a conversation. The purpose of National Marriage Boycott was to enlist all of our straight counterparts on college campuses who really felt, you know, like it was wrong that Prop 8 passed but didn't know what to do about it. And also engaging um, particularly, and this is close to, to my heart, bisexual people, people who are identified as bi. You know, if, if I uh, fall in love with a man and I can get married but the next day I meet a, a woman who, who takes my heart away, I can't get married, that doesn't seem um, really, really right. So um, 
Yeah, national marriage boycott was in your face, mostly out of anger, but also um, I think we had the fore foresight to see uh, that we really needed to involve our allies. And, and you asked people to sign a petition, right? We asked people to sign online. a pledge. Sign a pledge online, basically saying that uh, you won't get married until every person in the country has um, the right to get married. And, and uh, it was based on that federal level, that we can't keep going around state by state doing piecewise legislation. And it's still up, right? You can still sign, right? Yes, you can still sign up. Um, it's still going on. We're about um, in 20 different states right now, and we're very queer youth oriented on college campuses um, and hopefully later high school campuses. Um, what did you think when President Obama's Justice Department recently announced that they were going to no longer defend the federal law which bans? It's about time. It's about time. <laughs> um, I, I was <laughs> what a huge... What took them so long? I, exactly. I was a huge Obama supporter um, that 2008 election and it felt like my heart was in two different places because here was President Obama, somebody who was advocating change, but that same night in our state uh, a majority of the people who voted said that I'm not as worthy as uh, my straight counterparts. So. Okay, well, I want to come back to that. And I want to ask Steve. Steve, so now you, you've heard our two very articulate co-panelists co talk about these issues here that face us in the U.S., but it's a very, very different uh, struggle, a very, very different situation uh, where you're based and where you're doing your magnificent work. Please thank, you know, you have all of our thanks and, and admiration for it. T tell, give us a little bit of a sense of what it's like to be part of the, part of a gender non-conforming community in Cameroon and what the issues that your clients and, and, the, and the people you work with face where you, where you live. Yeah, well, um, you're right to say uh, gender non-conforming people because um, in uh, in Cameroon, and I think it's the uh, same uh, in, in in most of other African countries, um, people don't identify, identify themselves as uh, LGBTIQ. They will tell their Kwandenge in Cameroon or Gorjigan in Senegal or Stabane in, in South Africa. So. Um, so nobody's like nobody says they're gay, right? Nobody um, says I'm gay. Some people do, some people do, but, but most of people don't. They don't really identify themselves as as so. And uh, it's quite interesting because in the same time, the society pretends that homosexuality is un-African, that uh, it's exported or being exported by the West. That is the Western issue, and. Uh, uh, to speak specifically about Cameroon, uh, where I come from, uh, in 2006 there was a list of 50 homosexuals that was published in the press, and most of them were government officials, high rank government officials, like ministers. And so, for people in Cameroon, uh, gay people or homosexuals are people who have power or who have money, and that use, uh, who use that power or money to corrupt the youth. And uh, all there are, there are people who, um, who, uh, who are pedophiles. Uh, homosexuality is often mixed with, with lots of things, with, hom with pedophilia, with witchcraft, with many things. And these, are people uh, who are tar these are people who are targeted, subjects to targets or investigation and, and so forth? Yeah, the law, yeah. The law, the law as in 38 countries, uh, African countries, Cameroon uh, uh, has a law who, which uh, criminalizes same-sex practices. So if you're, if you're suspected, even if you're just suspected in Cameroon of being someone who has sexual relations with someone of the same sex, you can be arrested, yeah. jailed, yeah, for Fined, six, imprisoned. Yeah, for six months to five years imprisonment. Mm -hmm. And uh, in three countries like uh, Mauritania, Sudan, and uh, and Nigeria, you can even uh, face death penalty if you are a gay person. Did did you did you? See, I'm sure you saw uh, the recent. Um, just this month, within the last month, uh, statement from the UN w that uh, a, a 
a, a large number of countries, perhaps the largest number of countries ever signed on to a UN declaration uh, against these practices internationally. Was that, is that kind of thing helpful? Does that kind of thing get attention in Cameroon? Well, in not much attention. Um, usually, um, homosexuality gets attention when it's about a scandal. And uh, the press really knows about that. They know how to use the subject when something is, um, is a, well, when, when um, the story is about a scandal, uh, they, they, they will publish it. But things like uh, the UN um, publishing a, a statement is not very interesting to, is it to helpful, them. Is it helpful when, when countries in the West draw attention to these issues or does it, does it, not, uh, does it not reach the radar screen in, in Cameroon is it, or is it unhelpful? I mean, you know, because there's this debate among human rights activists more broadly that um, you know, we can push in the West on these issues, but sometimes it's helpful and sometimes you can push too much and make it difficult for what people in the actual country are trying to do. Well, it, it is helpful. It, it is helpful to, um, to express, to express uh, a, a, a general opinion, to, um, to make statements, uh, and, to, um, and to stress on the universality. Of, of the statement, because we as uh, local activists, we can always use those statements to try to um, make some advocacy uh, in our countries. Uh, and uh, but but it is more even more useful to um, to be able to. Uh, um, to, to, to speak to our, to our, to our officials because... Um, government to government pressure? Yeah, because uh, I'll take an example, recent example. We, we had the opportunity to, um, to meet the Prime Minister of Cameroon uh, with the, the support of uh, Human Rights Watch to present the, the, the report we, we published. Yes, it's, a, uh, it's an amazing report. I would recommend it to everybody, but there's a, I read it uh, 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 last week, this report that your Alternatives Cameroon did with Human Rights Watch yeah. on the situation. Yeah, and um, it didn't even know what was happening in this country. It didn't know that people were, uh, there were so many violations of People's you presented rights. it to the president? Yeah, we presented it and to him. And met in person with the president? The prime minister. The prime minister. The prime minister. The prime minister. Yes, and um, thanks to that, uh, we, were, we were able to engage with the government on, uh, on the issue. So, yes, it's important. The, I will say the international community can, can, uh, um, can help. Um, but you, you also have to keep in mind that um, we're working on a sensitive issue and that um, people, people working on the local level must not be put uh, in danger. Tell me just, um, now, your organization also works a lot with, on HIV AIDS issues, right? Which is, which, is a, which is a major health issue in Cameroon. Tell us a little bit about the work you do there. Well, we started with um, medical consultation as I'm a physician and I work in, uh, in a private clinic. So um, as we, we started the organization, people started coming to me to complain about uh, what they were, they were um, suffering from and they needed medical consultations. So we started by offering them medical consultations in the clinic and HIV counseling and testing. And um, two years later, we were able to, to, um, to get funds for an HIV clinic. So now we have an HIV clinic where we can provide them with uh, information, with uh, uh, material like condoms and lubricants, uh, with uh, consultations with HIV follow, follow up. Uh, for those who live with HIV. And uh, we also do a lot of advocacy around the issue and uh, 
for, for to take an, an example, Alternative is uh, now observer to the African Commission on Humans and, and People's Rights. And uh, we were able to initiate the creation of a committee on the rights of people living HIV and those at risk, meaning uh, men who have sex with men and uh, injecting drug users, sex workers. And it's also an, op an opportunity to um, speak about the issue on a regional level uh, to to advance it. It, re it really, I tell you, it really gives you a idea, right, of the scope of the issues that face us globally. I mean, when you're um, working to provide, you know, sexual health information to people in a country when the, the very activity is outlawed, it gives you a, a whole different perspective on the kind of issues that we're facing here. I mean, I would ask either, both of you, um, I mean, what do you, what do you think about when, you, when you're in court and you're battling for, for you know, the right to um, be lawfully married to someone of the same sex and you hear Steve talk about how these issues are so dramatically different and how they're fighting at such a more basic level. I mean, I suppose on one level it makes you very proud of what we've been able to accomplish already here, but on another level realize, you know, that the issues that, are face, that we all face are so you know, diverse. Well, I do think um, that this is a movement that's happening globally in a way that's incredibly exciting. And the conditions are vastly different, but some of the conversations do have similarities. Um, I had the, the privilege last year of going as a legal technical consultant to work with some lawyers in Nepal who um, are working to, because there was a S Supreme Court of Nepal decision saying that laws needed to be written and passed to end discrimination against LGBTI people and to open marriage to same-sex couples. Um, and yet, the, the issues have not been discussed very much in the country. So this was an example of a court decision that's incredibly important, but is ahead of where most people in the country are. And there are ways in which, in, in, in a less dramatic way, but we have the same issue in the US where we have advances, sometimes through court decisions, sometimes through legislation in some places. And you know, a statistic that I love is based on the recent census data, 42%, see I'm going to a think tank, I'm getting used to using numbers, <laughs> instead of case citations. You're gonna be good at um, it. 42% of the US population now lives in a state that has at least some recognition for same-sex couples. That now was that's my, m oh, totally quality cool, matters put that right? out. But, um, but, at the no, no, but at the same not time... The not the 42%, just the compilation of the number. <laughs> but, the, but at the same time, um, 40 states have passed laws and, and a large majority of those have actually amended their constitutions to say no recognition of same-sex couples, no marriage, Some, a lot of them say no civil union, no domestic partnership, no nothing, you can't even buy a couch together. Um, that's not true, but they would do that if they could. Um, and, and so there's this huge gulf, and we have it in this country, I think it's, it's, it's not the same kind of gulf, and it's not um, the, the, you know, the threat of, of severe government punishment isn't the same, it's not on the same scale as what's true in Cameroon and, and many other countries. But the thing that I think is similar is that what causes change, and I say this as a lawyer, I have lots of technical training, but the thing that really is the engine of change is having conversations where there's enough safety to be able to be visible. And so what I was really doing in Nepal was you know, talking about the Constitution, here's the law of Kentucky, whatever. It was, I am a lesbian, I'm married to a woman legally, and we have families, and my mother-in-law wasn't very happy about me when she first met me, which was 26 years ago, because I'm not Chinese American, but mostly because I'm female. And over the years, um, she got used to it, and she got happy with it, and she, was even more stubborn than my wife, and she hung on, even though she was very sick, in order to be able to be present to see us get married. 
Wow, that's, a, that's an amazing story. And Jenny, uh, Jenny officiated at a wedding uh, of two of my close friends here in, um, in Los Angeles, not here in Los Angeles, here in California in Los Angeles. And if you've, never been, if you've never been to a wedding in which two of your same-sex friends get married, you have a whole different uh, uh, understanding of the importance of, of, of what we're fighting for. So Alexis, when you hear Steve talk about the issues that they, uh, that they face, does it, does, it, uh, does it inspire you? Does it make you think that we're, uh, uh, does it make you feel lucky or does it make you feel, how does it make you feel? I think uh, it's twofold. Um, one is yes, I feel lucky and, and privileged. I think privilege is the word to, to be in the US and to not be able to face those issues, but at the same time, uh, it also does inspire me um, and, and really makes me realize that we have to keep fighting. Um, even if the issues here may seem a little bit more insignificant on a global scale, it's still very, very important. Um, I don't think that, yeah, I think any government that does anything uh, to reduce the dignity and, and equality of its citizens is is something that's wrong and something that should be stopped no matter what the scale is. So I think it's definitely good to have that perspect that global perspective of, of what's happening in the real world. And also, if you know that history, if you know those facts and that background, that's very powerful stuff to say, okay, we might not have it that bad here, but it's that bad elsewhere. And all because of the fact of who somebody loves or how somebody identifies, and that's wrong, and I think that it's really easy for people to really connect with that um, and, and see, the other, see the other side of the issue. Because it's all, you know, it all becomes an accident of birth, right? I mean, whether you're born in Los Angeles or New York or in Europe or in Cameroon, it's like just a, like an accident of birth, you know? It's, it, it's all the same issues. Yes, and well, and you're right to be fighting, and this is what we told ourselves when we started. We told ourselves that if we want to live tomorrow, like uh, in the U.S., if we, ha we want to have their problems, then we have to start now. <laughs> so uh, you 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 living this reality because some other people fought before you. So keep keep the fight. All right, we're gonna. Um, we, this is we're, we're we're broken up into several segments, and now we're going to open the floor up for questions uh, for any one of the panelists. Um, so raise your hand, and we will. And tell us your name and where you're from. This gentleman, I think, had his hand up first. Yes. Hi, I'm Jonathan. I'm from Seattle University, and I had a question for Steve, actually. Um, where do you think this stigma that being LGBTQ is an African stems from, and how do you think Africans can change this? Do you get it, Yuan, right? Okay, thank you. Okay, well, um, I think it's a pretext. People pretend that it's un African because they don't want to accept that. And, and what we usually do for those who are out, of course, we um, we say, well, it's un African, but well, I am gay, I'm African, so I'm, how how can you pretend that um, something is not African when you have African people who are that or who are living that reality? And what we usually tell them also is that. Well, let, okay, let's admit that it's on African, uh, then, um, and that uh, it's unnatural because some other people say it's unnatural. Then, um, if 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 it's unnatural, how do gay people how do gay people get to uh, how how do they do they get born because they, they you have gay people never they, they don't give. They, they don't give children. It's only um, it was straight people who give children, and yeah, we've heard that. Children, we've heard that here too. Yeah, their children are gay people. So, yeah. okay, thanks. <laughs> yes, uh, wait, they'll, they'll hand you the mic so everybody can hear you. Okay. Um, what I have is tell us of, your name. My name is Allison, and I'm a UCSD student. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have kind of a statement and kind of 
I hope that you guys will agree with me. Um, I feel that all of these are very extraordinary ideas. All of you guys have done, you know, some amazing things. Um, but I, I feel that when, once people have reached adulthood, that these ideas, these, this hegemonic discourse is already formed. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to change these ideas. But when we think about where, where this comes from and with children, who, who are in their lives? First of all, it's their parents. And it's very difficult as a society to go into homes and change ideas. But then we have, who do you think of next? The teachers. Um, and I think that, that teachers need to be educated um, to deal with the bullying and the violence um, that, that's going on in schools. And I, I think this would be a first step to changing everything because when these children grow up, they've had these mentors, K through 12, you know, through college. I think that this would be the way to change the future because we're working with these people who have already formed these ideas, but you know, we, we need to mold a new generation. More focus of this uh, in schools, and you know, the, and President Obama recently did a White House conference on bullying. Did you go to that? Were you were you at that, Alexis? What do you think about what, Alexis? What can we? Uh, can you address uh, her question about what we can do earlier in schools and with parents? Um, I think it definitely starts with conversations. Uh, the people who are queer, are LGBT, need to come out if it's safe and have those conversations with their family. I was privileged enough not to have a, a, a terribly bad situation um, with my family, but my mom you know, still voted yes on Prop 8. And when I told her the pain that, that happened, um, I think she finally opened her eyes and realized that. So I definitely agree with you. When adults reach a certain age, their ideas are formed and it seems very difficult to change those ideas. But if you're close to somebody and you share um, your feelings and emotions about something, then I think that makes it a little bit easier. And I also think for the generations that are coming up, up now who feel really comfortable coming out when they're like 13, um, some of those kids are gonna be teachers themselves. And I think that's really hopeful um, for me, especially. As far as what we can do right now, it's, it's a little bit difficult because you still have those people who have the ide ideology that we shouldn't even be talking about sex at all in schools. So how do you, how do you kind of navigate that and, and go about it in a way of, of doing something or producing a program or taking action where you can address those concerns but also um, are able to do exactly what you're saying, provide mentors. Do you, think, do you think the most powerful individual political act we can take is to come out? Um, I kind of do right now, maybe if I had time to think about it, no, but... Um, what about you, Jenny, do you yeah. think that? Yeah, absolutely, uh, including if you're, you know, if you're not gay, to come out as somebody who cares about it and and, and has views and is invested in society being good. Is that a realistic, Steve, option in Cameroon? I mean, is that a, that's, must be a very powerful political act in Cameroon to come out. Yes, it is, it is very, very powerful. Um, but in the same time, um, a lot of people choose not to. It's not, not to, always safe. Yeah, not to come out because it's not safe. And what they do is just, live like uh, like everybody and try to be uh, models a lot of people who have succeeded in their lives and who have helped their community or their families um, are actually known to be gay and it's people don't speak about that but people know that they are gay people and uh, it, still they are an example for others so in some way you can still uh, give lessons even without coming out. Very uh, actually, actually, Richard, if I could just say, I mean, I, this, this point I think is, is really important about teachers in schools. And I think, I like to think of it that, you know, people with authority over any environment, whether it's a school or a workplace or any institution, have responsibility to make sure people in that environment are safe. It is terribly difficult. It's a lot to expect, and I don't think it's appropriate to push people to come out if they're not safe. It actually wasn't that long. I mean, we're talking about a transformed world in some ways here in the US today. Well, it's not that transformed in many parts of this country, and it wasn't that long ago um, that 
that it was very scary most places. And it wasn't that long before that that people couldn't get a license to practice law if they were known to be gay. And in many parts of the country, people can be fired if they're when not I, so... When I went to go work for President Clinton uh, in 1993, you could not get a security clearance to work at the White House if you were openly gay. And he changed that right when he appointed, when he, I was among, like, this was in 1993, not very long ago. Well, the, but the part of the point is teachers play this incredibly important role, as you said, but in many places they, they can be fired, or at least they think they can. I mean, if they're a public school teacher, there are legal protections, but the reality is that local school boards exert tremendous authority, and that's part of why I mean, we do test case litigation, and, and part of those, the rules that are in place now are because of those test cases. But it does take people like, you know, parents, I was going to say our parents, but I guess now, given my age, it's my peer group, you know, being willing to in, engage and insist on an environment where school officials can, can do that job and make things be safe. And look, the reality is, sure, as people get older, we get stuck in our ideas, but, um, you know, I think if, if my 89-year-old mother-in-law could do that journey, and my own parents were much slower than they ought to have been, and that they were members of the ACLU, and they still thought being gay was unnatural. You know, my father was a research scientist, and he said stuff, like, what are you talking about? But this was generational, and yet people walk that path. If people in their lives encourage them, to do that. It really is like, do you, do you love your child or your nephew or your neighbor or whatever enough to sort of hear the pain that they're expressing? And statistics are great, but it's really that people can hear each other's pain if we put ourselves out there and open ourselves up to really be hurt because you express your pain. We sort of grow up stuffing that down because you don't want to be vulnerable. But that's the part of it, that if we have to tell other people that it actually really hurts to hear slurs in the hallway. It actually really hurts. Or to be told you're not good enough to get married really hurts. And if we, if we take that additional step of sharing that, then a lot of people can start to hear what was never actually expressed to them before. My name's Sam, I'm a medical student here at UCSD. Um, so I guess any of you can respond to the question, but I don't think any of us would disagree that there are really considerable health disparities, specifically sexual health disparities between LGBT and, and strictly heterosexual populations. So my question is, how do we push for really aggressive sexual health initiatives without pathologizing the LGBT community? Okay, that's an excellent question, Jenny. And did you see uh, just this week the Department of HHS made an announcement? Maybe you could, can you talk, can you take that one? Yeah, a, a little bit. Uh, I think we all may have something to say about this. I think, and I think it, it, this is, um, so the Institute of Medicine issued a really important report with a series of recommendations for addressing health disparities that affect LGBT people in this country. Uh, which includes, I think, very significantly calling for research money because among the problems, I mean, there's been enough research to, to show that there's, there's real disparities but, um, and enough to see how much we don't know. Uh, and so calling for more research is really important. Uh, but they've, they've set protocols and particularly looking at um, youth suicide and suicide attempts, looking at substance abuse, looking at minority stress syndrome, looking at a number of these things including um, discrimination by healthcare professionals that cause people not to go back to the doctor so that basic wellness care isn't delivered. These, so this report, I think, is really groundbreaking. Actually, under President Clinton, there was the first step in this, in this direction uh, with the Healthy People 2010, but this is a huge step forward. Yeah, I just just want to add that, uh, well, you you must you, you must use any opportunity. Um, very recently, um, uh, Cameroon has uh, integrated men who are sex with men in its uh, national AIDS plan, and that was thanks thanks to um, global advocacy. Uh, um, and that um, the global fund uh, said in its uh, in its call for proposal. 
uh, that uh, any proposal must have uh, an MSM comp component. And uh, now we are using that opportunity to say, well, um, in order to, um, men who are sex women who live HIV do not only have HIV infection, they also have other infection. And we are trying to, I'm, I'm a member of the CCM, the Country Coordinating Mechanism, and um, we are trying to push the government to, um, to put in, uh, in place HIV clinics for men who are sex women that propose uh, um, services related to sexual health, like uh, um, consultations of a proctologist or sexologist, etc. And uh, last month, I, I was in Ouagadougou, where I was uh, also coordinated uh, the first uh, training on HIV and men who are sex men um, with the University of Ouagadougou, which is in Burkina Faso. Uh, uh, people who attended the training were health workers or social workers, and or even um, or even uh, LGBT activists, and. Um, this is also another way to um, to work on on the access of uh, LGBT people to sexual health and to give the knowledge to medical workers in order to appropriately uh, respond to the needs of those people. Richard, could you, could you have one yeah. more? Because Rodney had his hand up. Yes. I know that entire time. Oh, oh, good. Yes. Putting you on the spot. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Rodney. I'm a graduate student at UCLA. And I just want to thank all of you so much for you know, the wisdom and the inspiration that you've offered to all of us. And my question is um, a little bit more complex, and I'm going to try not to intellectualize it too much. But um, as a graduate student in African American studies, I naturally see the parallels between the LGBT struggle for human rights and the African American struggle for, for human rights of the 60s. And my question falls along the lines of how do we delineate and cross that boundary, but also learn from the struggles of the 60s? Because I do feel like there are so many parallels between the struggles that we're going through now with desegregating the military um, and then ending the don't ask, don't tell policy. How do we create that process of change within not only our own community, the LGBT community, but also within the broader societies so that we don't have um, some, of, some of the amazing challenges and problems that we do have within our own community. So can you talk a little bit more about that? All right, that's a great question. I think, actually, I, I think that we could probably do a whole panel just on that question, but we'll, we'll, we'll try to get some insight from everybody. And Alexis and I talked, we talked on the way over here a little bit about the impact that uh, issues of, of race have played in your own personal life uh, and the intersection with sexual orientation issues. So Absolutely. why don't you lead us off? Um, I think it's critical to involve people of color in any fight for human rights. Um, any minority needs to be involved, uh, particularly the LGBT rights movement. I'm more familiar with California because I was involved in it, but we did a really terrible job of involving people from the, from the black community, but also the Latino community and, and other minority communities and made really big mistakes like calling LGBT rights the new civil rights movement and not realizing that that is going to, you know, step on the toes of people who were involved in the 60s and, and uh, be really insensitive, I think, to some people who might not be comfortable with the LGBT struggle being so uh, synonymous and, and um, compared to, to that incredible struggle that happened in the 60s. And uh, I think it takes a lot of reaching out, a lot of extra work. And um, even in my own organizing that I've done, a lot, everyone around me was white. It, it was like me and maybe one or two other people. And nobody's gonna take that first step to say, hey, there's a, an event going on in the black community. We should be there. We should be talking to people about that. Nobody's going to do that except somebody who has that consciousness and somebody who realizes that that's necessary. And so you take it upon yourself, even if you're the only one, you realize that that's something that has to be done. Um, and so I think it, it, it's, I don't want to say that it's all on, on people of color, 
but it has to be on the people who, who know and who realize and have that in the back of their mind. And they have to be empowered to speak up enough and empowered to take action enough and, um, and to educate those people who are around them who can also help support them um, and do something. So I'm, I'm very much for involving people of color and, and putting them in positions of leadership because we need that to, to, to be successful in the long run. Yeah, I guess I would just add that what among the things that I think is really exciting about what's happening now is that these issues are percolating everywhere and in, in different paces, pl different paces and different ways, but you know, all over the U.S. and all and around the world, and because there are queer people everywhere in every family, in every community, in every different group. You know, we're everywhere, and so I guess what seems important to students, you know, and all of us, you know, we're just sort of, we're students in our life is like, learn, what, do we, what are the lessons that we learn from what people have tried in different places? And how, and how can we be more effective because we're working more closely together with new tools, new ways of communicating, but, you know, kind of recognizing that this is about conversations that are happening around every dinner table and um, that in, in every household, people who are uncomfortable say, oh, you got this idea from over there. You're not really like that. You're like I always thought you were. You, you're having some bad influence from some other group. Right. And so, I, I mean, I think that there are similar challenges everywhere and that it is, as with so many issues, we're more powerful when we're, you know, when we're having more different ties that bind, which means not just queer issues and not just economic justice and environmental issues, but seeing the connections and collaborating among things. Right. And while that question had a very, had a, sort of had its origins in U.S. policy, certainly viewing these issues as global human rights issues would have a direct impact on your work, correct? Yeah, well, to speak about um, about uh, Cameroon or alternatives Cameroon, um, we we uh, we when we were discussing about uh, about uh, um, our strategic, we 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 just told ourselves that we we are not just uh, LGBTIQ people; we are Cameroonian citizens, and so we need to get involved in any issues uh, around uh, human rights in, in Cameroon. And uh, that's why we decided to be a human rights organization, not an LGBT organization. Uh, though it will be difficult to register as an LGBT uh, organization in Cameroon, but it's another issue. Uh, and so what we do is we, we try to relate um, uh, with other human rights organizations to we we have um, a set of uh, human rights uh, researchers uh, in uh, in inside the country, and uh, who are not not always LGBT people. They, they they might be straight, but they they work on on human rights. They are lawyers, uh, for example, or jurists, and and it's it's a way to. Uh, to 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 keep uh, um, uh, to keep in touch with the reality and to um, to reflect um, to integrate uh, your um, to integrate uh, yourself in the society because you you um, we've we've real, we've realized recently that um, if we had not done so we we won't be able today to, uh, for example, be at the CCM uh, because people, people um, will say like the, 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 it's the case in other countries uh, that, well, yes, let's admit you, you're gay, but, and so what, 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 what next, what, what, how does it affect us? Are you? Uh, why don't you speak about uh, um, people with disabilities? Why only LGBT rights? Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, great. So I tell you what we're going to do now, and then we're going to come back. We're going to uh, this next little um, uh, part of our panel. 
we're going to try to ask you to break up into um, smaller groups and do a little 10 or 12 minutes of brainstorming on ide about ideas that we could, everybody in the room can take to advance the cause of, um, the, to advance this as a human rights issue, uh, things you can do locally, things we can do nationally, and things we might be able to do uh, to help efforts uh, globally.